Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Seven summers ago, Paul Gogan and I headed off to Alpine, California, just south of Lake Tahoe, to participate in the tour of the California Alps, more popularly called the Death Ride. Paul and I were frequent cycling buddies, and the previous fall, this U.S. Marine who was studying at the Naval Postgraduate School had invited me to do the ride with him. Uh, he had encouraged me to come do the ride with him. Uh, Paul flat out challenged me to do this ride. And we trained together all spring. And we were reasonably optimistic that when we set out at 4.30 in the morning to cover that 125 miles over five mountain passes and over 15,000 feet of vertical climb, that we would be successful. Well, around mile 50, I began to feel a bit nauseous. For some reason, the energy bars that I'd trained with were not agreeing with me at all. And it was very difficult for me to put any kind of fuel in my body. I slogged over the next two climbs. And at mile 75 at a rest stop, I was able to force down a few slices of turkey meat. By mile 100, I had reached what Pastor Kevin talked about two weeks ago. I bonked into my rope, out of gas, nothing in the tank. By the grace of God, I was able to reach the final rest stop where I sat for over 20 minutes trying to gather my thoughts and enough enthusiasm to finish the race. As I sat there, there were riders coming and going by the hundreds, and I finally felt like I could join them. And as I climbed on my bike, I turned to another gentleman that was getting on his bike next to me, and I just casually said, I don't know if I've got the bullets to finish this. Well, his name was Tim, and he lives in Grass Valley, and I'd never met him before, and he told me that the next six miles was pretty flat, and that that final climb was really not that bad. And then he extended an invitation to me that gave me hope. Five words that changed my perspective. Just get on my wheel. In cycling, to get on somebody's wheel is to benefit from the reduction in aerodynamic drag. And in essence, if you stick close to that wheel, you can save up to 30% of your output, your effort, as you carry along. And somehow, when you're focused on the rider in front of you, you're less focused on the pain and challenge that you're facing yourself. Now, I'll tell you, there is a bit of a trust issue. There's only a gap of maximum 12 inches between you and the rider in front of you. And really, for maximum effort, it's really only two or three inches. And at speed, this requires that you have confidence in both the rider in the front and behind. Well, I was in no condition to be traveling at speed, so I think we were pretty safe there. But frankly, this was a big give on Tim's part. He had to completely change his game plan for finishing out his ride. Well, as Pastor Kevin reminded us, each week in this series, those who received this letter had bunked. They had reached their limit. Between persecution and personal question, they were ready to take the easier way. They were inclined to coast downhill rather than face another climb. And then he gives them five words of hope. 
fix your eyes on Jesus. Now, the author had laid out for them, and Pastor Kevin has unpacked this in weeks prior, that Jesus is superior. Jesus is greater than angels. Jesus, greater than Moses. Jesus, greater than the priesthood. Jesus, new covenant, greater than the old covenant economy. And he reminds them that Jesus is our focal point for faith. Hebrews 12, 2 says that let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Well, that chapter 12 starts out with the word therefore. And around here, we like to look and see what it's there for. And it's actually there for another therefore that's in the middle of chapter 10. And at that point, the author is ready to send his readers back out onto the course to get them back into the race. All, all that came before that was classroom instruction. Important stuff as it was, but it all led up to moving them back out to run their race. And this is what he was telling them. Jesus is worthy of their pursuit and wholly capable to bring them to the finish line. Now, it was time to move. And if we take a look back at that section in chapter 10, and I'll, I'll read that for you, several verses here, we get three things that the author was telling them that is going to play in their favor. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. And so as he instructs them to get on Jesus' wheel, trusting God's provision to carry them through, he offers them three encouragements. Draw near in full assurance. Hold steady to your hope that he provides. And I would say very importantly, don't forget your teammates. Now, I don't know if you've ever watched a bike race or maybe you've seen on Saturday morning that string of riders that's going around to Silomar about 7.30 or 8 o'clock in the morning. There's a very interesting phenomenon that takes place in the peloton. Not, not that exercise bike that you see on TV, but a group of cyclists each riding the wheel of the rider ahead of them. Now, whether it's two or 20 or dozens, everyone is benefiting from the effort provided by the leader. And as long as you're in the slipstream of the rider in front of you, you've got a pretty good chance of staying with the pack and finishing well. In essence, the lead rider is pulling everyone along. That's what Tim was offering me that day on the mountain. Stay on my wheel. But here's a problem. If a gap develops, you lose the benefit and you begin to fall back. And if you're the last rider on the train, you'll most likely just see everyone else pulling away and you're on your own. Well, in a bike race, it's every rider for themselves and they want that gap to develop. But in the race of faith, we want everyone to finish. In fact, we want everyone to start the race, which is why last week Pastor Kevin gave you an invitation to say yes to Jesus and become part of his forever family. And if you thought about doing that and you didn't make that move last week, I can encourage you to give that strong consideration and enter this race of faith. We want everybody to benefit from the strong pull of the Prince of Peace. 
And so we find the author's instruction to encourage brothers and sisters to stay close, to stay connected, to benefit from being part of the body, that this is strong encouragement for how we should live today. In our isolating situation, the things that we're going through these days, that no doubt some of you, just like I am, we're feeling as though we're slipping off the back of the pack. Uh, We've lost the benefit of being together. And that's why Pastor Kevin has continued weekly updates to you. It's why Pastor Dennis and I created the One Another series you can find on the website. It's why Sherry and her team invite you to attend Wednesday nights at Shoreline Online. And why Kim McDonald continues to offer up online Bible studies in small groups. Why Danny and Keith hold a weekly online connection for middle school and high school students. And why Greg's team maintains a robust resource page for kids at shoreline.church. And it's why we invite you to participate in the Good Neighbor Initiative. An opportunity for you to offer up a lifeline to those in your very own neighborhood. Don't slip off the back. Stay connected. Fix your eyes on Jesus. For each of us, no doubt somebody comes to mind that you're missing out on making contact with. Call them. Text them. Email them. Mail, mail them. Encourage them. Or be encouraged by them. And if you've got somebody in mind and you don't have their contact info, send me an email, roy at shoreline.church. I'll pass the word along, and if I can, I'll help you get connected. Well, on that Saturday afternoon, Tim was my encouragement. And sitting on Tim's wheel, I got to tell you, more than once he'd look back and he'd say, is this pace okay? Which essentially translates, are you doing all right? Can you stay on my wheel? And just as we started the final climb, he motions me over to the side of the road and he said, you know, I like to stop at this spot right here and stretch a little bit and just make sure I'm prepared for the final climb. I I don't think he needed that. I think he knew that I needed that if I had any chance of making it to the end of the road. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25 said, Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Encourage one another. I've got a question. What keeps you from keeping Jesus clearly in your sights? And how might you encourage another to do the same? Well, chapter 10 finishes up with a call to persevere. And these believers are reminded of the races that they've run thus far. How they've stuck fast to the wheel of Jesus in the course of so many obstacles. And after all, this is an endurance race and we need to press on to the end. And then there's this great hall of faith in chapter 11. Those who'd been called by God to complete their course and carry it through. Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Rahab, so many others, all who had finished their race, having been promised the prize, and yet they had imperfect vision of its total provision. F.F. Bruce, in his commentary on Hebrews, he says this, In Old Testament times, he, the author of Hebrews, points out that there were many men and women who had nothing but the promises of God to rest upon, without any evidence that these promises would be fulfilled. Yet so much did these promises mean to them that they regulated the whole course of their lives in their light. They acted as if the present reality was already a situation of the promised state to come. They somehow had eyes to see the reality of their faith and to act accordingly. Goodness, they lived as though they had seen the empty tomb, as though they had seen the risen Jesus. We have Jesus. We have the reality of his resurrection. 
how much more our propensity to persevere. Well, now we're back to that original therefore, the beginning of chapter 12. Since we are surrounded by such a cloud of witnesses, let us run with perseverance. Let me tell you about that word witnesses. It means so much more than just somebody standing to the finish line and cheering you on. The word contains this sense that it includes those who have finished well and whose mere presence encourages and challenges us to completion. And I think that's the whole point of chapter 11, to speak into the Hebrews that there is greatness behind you who did what you're called to do. Well, that Saturday afternoon at the final rest stop, I sat next to these two old guys. I know what you're thinking. They were a good 10 years my senior. And I went back and checked. The oldest man to finish the five passes that year was 84 years old. Several years older than me. These two guys, they were in a far better state and condition than I was. And when they pedaled away, there was a mix of motivation and male ego that helped me attempt to finish. Well, who are you sitting next to? Who are you watching that keeps you moving forward? But more importantly, who is watching you that gets inspired and encouragement to continue their faith race because you fixed your eyes on Jesus. We become witnesses just like those in chapter 11 for those who are yet to come. We're running the race ahead of them, setting an example on their behalf. Well, I've got tons of heroes of faith in my life, as I'm sure many of you do. And many of those are people from right here in Shoreline. Now, I've had the unique perspective in my dozen or so years here that most of that has been spent in the area of overseeing children's ministry. And these days, as I oversee marriage and military ministry, I, it's great honor to point out to you those who from Naval Postgraduate School and Defense Language Institute have become part of Shoreline and they've made it their part to cheer on kids and challenge them to stay on Jesus' wheel. My earliest memory, Joe and Diane Lindquist, who owned the three-year-old classroom and were here every Sunday morning ready to share with those little ones about the love of Jesus. Craig and Stephanie Maxey, who helped us transition into a new curriculum and they helped us cement our ministry strategies in surrounding that. Eliza Fitzgerald, who pointed out our key verse for that long season when we referred to children's ministry as Anchor Bay. It came from Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Nikki Bellinger and her girls, who served in every capacity of kid men that I can think of. There were the Nussbaumers, the Sweatlands, the Thompsons, the Rays, the Coils, the Rose, the Bowmans, the Highs, the Halls. And I've left out so many. And many of you have chosen to be part of that race as well. And these are not better than others or than you, any that would come along later or who were there before them. They are just among so many who have said, my eyes are fixed on Jesus. And I want to point these kids to them too. For me, being reminded of the long line of legacy keepers points me to the foundations of our faith and the full legitimacy, legitimacy of keeping my eyes fixed that way. Now, when we look at that, the author reveals for us four things that come into view when we fix our eyes on Jesus. The first one is, is that he is our standard of obedience. For the joy set before him he endured the cross. The cross was one of the most painful, torturous, and agonizing forms of taking a person's life. Yet Jesus knew and accepted that this was his lot to fill. Way back in Hebrews chapter 2, 
it says, in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. In chapter 5, it says, son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. In Luke chapter 24, we read where Jesus reminded those men on the Emmaus Road the extent of his lot. This is what he said to them. How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? Very few of us will be called to suffer anything remotely reminiscent to the magnitude of Jesus. And it's clear that those addressed in this letter had experienced considerable persecution and they surely expected more. I'll tell you, throughout our world today, there are people in other parts of our country who are persecuted for their faith, who are dying for their faith. At worst, in regards to our faith stance, you and I might be sneered at. We might be smeared on social media or we might be shunned by a family member or friend because of our stand. We might face rejection as we reach out in Jesus' kind of caring or in Jesus' brand of love. Our risks are so minimal by comparison. And yet in all of that, still it's appropriate appropriate for us to heed the words of Scripture that we would always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but that we would do this out of gentleness and respect. I've got a question. Is there anything that you feel that God is calling you to that you've yet to say yes to? Perhaps a way that he is calling you to stand up for him or to stand up for another person in principles that would underline the way God calls you to do? Is there anything that holds you back? Well, Jesus is our standard of endurance. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God Consider him who endured the opposition of sinners. And I just want to ask you, what have we had to endure for our faith? What have we shied away from for fear of discomfort or danger? What are we prepared to endure as we determine to stand firm in a biblical worldview more and more at odds with our developing culture. Well, not all endurance is faith-generated or related. Believers and non-believers alike are facing challenges in our very day. But I tell you, whether it's the inconvenience of wearing a mask, the seeming incongruities of who can do what where, or the idea that your home now triples as office and classroom as well, we can view all things through a spiritual lens and we could be brought into perspective with the words of the Apostle Paul as he spoke to the church at Corinth. He said, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, on what, on what is unseen. Jesus is our source and standard of humility. That cross was the ultimate of humiliation. It was designed to bring death for those who were considered to be the dregs of society. Obliging himself 
to the cross was the ultimate in humility. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. In Hebrews 13, the, the, what follows, these words are also in there. Pastor Kevin moves into this next week. But Hebrews 13, 12 and 13 says, So Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace that he bore. So not only was the cross this humiliating form of torture and death from a Roman or a Gentile perspective, but added to that was this huge stigma of him having be, been rejected by the leaders of his very own people. And then the additional stigma of this whole thing being played out outside the parameters of the city and the stigma of crucifixion. And yet the author summons us to proudly bear this shame right along with Jesus. And remember back in the Hall of Faith, chapter 11, the testimony regarding Moses states that he considered shame for the sake of Christ to be superior to the wealth of Egypt. This makes me ask me, and I'm asking you too, what are we too proud to do for him? Is there anything that we see that is beneath us that he would ask us to do on his behalf or in his name for another? Finally, Jesus is our sustainer of hope. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He scorned its shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Four times in this letter, we are reminded of this act of completion. Jesus sat down, having brought the fruition that he'd been called to carry out. The psalmist revealed it back in Psalm 110, centuries before. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Jesus confirmed it for himself in Mark 14. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming in the clouds of heaven. To Jesus, the completion of his task and his post-resurrection positional authority was a foregone conclusion. And Pastor Kevin covered this back in our second message. This sitting down symbolizes that the deed was done. The task was finished. The race was over. Victory. Hebrews 12, chapter, th chapter 12, verse 3, it says, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. That phrase, grow weary and lose heart, it contains the very words that were used by Aristotle to describe how an athlete lunges and collapses at the finish line. But here in this passage, it indicates that if we keep our eyes on Jesus, we're able to finish strong. Fifteen miles. That's how far it was to the finish line from the rest stop that day. Tim was right. The first six were relatively flat. And then we started to climb. And I stuck to Tim's wheel with everything that I had. I, I could barely hang on to the handlebars. My, my hands were numb. My arms were in pain. I just wanted to drop them off the bars and finish off with whatever happened. 
but I knew that wouldn't be wise. And I slogged it out until we rounded the bend and we crested climb number five. And there, less than the length of a football field away, was the finish line and this great crowd of witnesses which included those who were there who had finished the race before us. And I tell you, I felt as fresh then as when I had wheeled on the course over 10 hours earlier. Victory. Is there anything that stands in the way of us standing firm in the hope provided by Jesus' finished work? Well, because Jesus is our source of faith and hope, we can worship more passionately, encouraged by faithful witnesses, both ancient and modern. One of those faithful witnesses is Isaiah English. He's a Sunday morning volunteer, and when we worship in song, he is standing at the top of the ramp all in. And I spy him, and I am so inspired. Because Jesus is our source of faith and hope, we can surrender more fully, encouraged by those who had greater vision, even if they had less to see. Well, not that she has less to see, but my friend Carolyn Leitchie has provided so many with a firm witness of faith surrender. When I got word that a former Shoreline NPS family was facing some very tough decisions on care for their son, I immediately turned to Carolyn who in turn reached out to them to offer prayer and encouragement far beyond what I could have done. And yet her example serves for me to be able to see more fully. Because Jesus is our source of faith and hope, we can follow more closely, encouraged by the fact that God's work is done and Jesus' finished work is victorious on our behalf. I'm walking through the book of Philippians with a group of guys online. And week after week, I'm encouraged by the impact of Jesus' victory upon their lives as each one of these men shows how they follow his leading and live out his calling and love. Because Jesus is our source of faith and hope, we can witness more naturally, encouraged by the reality of his reward. These feel like troubling and turbulent times. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth saying that if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Jesus provides for us that our finish line is really a starting line. Well, I finished those five climbs of the death ride I did it for a patch and a pin. Well, that and an ice cream bar. But when I think of our faith and what Jesus has provided for us, how could I endure anything less than that for so much more? What's your death ride? What is it that has you feeling ready to bonk or at the end of your rope? or in conflict over what should be your next steps. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of your faith. He's the one that provides your victory. Let's pray. Father, you are our standard of obedience of endurance, of humility. And you are the one that offers up hope, not just for finishing today's race, but hope from the starting line into all eternity where you sit at the right hand of the throne of God. Father, find us faithful in keeping our eyes fixed upon you. Amen.
and amen. This morning, after each of our services at 9.30 and 11 and 12.30, Patty, our Connections Director, and Pastor Sean would love to meet with you online. And if you miss being at church and connecting with us after the service, or maybe you're new and we haven't met you yet, please jump on this video call and say hello. Uh, You'll find the link on the front page of the website. We would love to hear from you. Not only how you're doing, but we'd love to give you information on some upcoming things that, and ways that you can get involved here at Shoreline. If you need prayer for anything, please call. The number will be on the screen. Or you can email prayer at shoreline.church. And if you're new to Shoreline, we'd like to give you some more information about the church. And you can text welcome to that same number so that we can welcome you properly. And if you have any questions or you'd like any other information at all, just email informa- info, pardon me, info at shoreline.church. Now, wherever you happen to be, if you're able, if you'd stand and allow me to offer up to you a benediction. And I take this from Romans chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of hope Fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Blessings be upon you.